There are many things humanity does not know. For instance, you're a part of humanity, right? Or at least I hope you are. Let's see, 349th decimal of pi. Exactly. The same line of thinking is pretty much something that we have dragged with us from the prehistoric ages to now. As we've advanced as a species, advice that was known and passed down that could save your life becomes tales, which were told referencing something long ago, which became just stories that we need not fear. The problem is, upon, you know, time passing, this was an issue at one point, which begs the question, why did it stop? With this knowledge, that even though there is most definitely a 349th decimal of pi, just because most of us don't know it without looking up, and don't be a dork who googles it and says they knew the whole time, I don't know, I'm in your walls. He's in your goddamn wall! Something that clearly exists can be a complete unknown for most, and to some, they may not even think it's a real thing. In the past, humanity has had many stories of creatures or instances that appeared to have lived or that we've run across at some point in time, and the interaction may have been less than stellar. Wendigos, Skinwalkers, Nessie, the Beast of Jevodon, Dragons, Bigfoot, and many, many more are hypothesized to have been alive or are still alive. And I loosely use the term hypothesize, but they have never really been officially categorized into the tree of life. That said, it's not the first time that we have hypothesized that something is alive, but haven't seen evidence of it until much later. Take the colossal squid, for instance. Despite sailors and merchants saying that they clearly saw these things grabbing ships with literal damage to their ships as well, or even some just not returning at all, colossal squids would not be seen for hundreds of years until we went into the depths of the ocean. Like, no joke, that was considered to be the Kraken back in the day, and we just casually know now that it's out there in the ocean. Absolutely horrific. Still not as much of an abomination as the anglerfish, though. The joke is never going to end because it's a legitimate hate for this creature. I know it didn't do anything to me, but after seeing it for the first time, uh, this it's really just on sight now. Anyhow, in the events of Cryptid, which perfectly explains the idea that something exists that we just don't know it's there because it's escaped detection, a creature is stacking bodies, and it's just arrived into town for a decade hunt. Dropping anything that gets close to it, humanity would seemingly be ill-equipped to deal with this threat. But the real question is, how is this animal adapted to the modern day so well that it could escape detection by our species, and where did it come from? Let's discuss that in today's episode. We kick off our story with Chicken Soup for the Soul really jazzed about this movie. It's in the opening scene like three times, I think. Egregious error on their part for thinking I wouldn't notice. It's currently raining, which is always a good time for cryptids to come out. Just is. I don't make the rules, I just work here. We see something on the ground as a car approaches. Something looks up at him and then he slams on his brakes and looking out, he spots really there's nothing there. He gets out to inspect his truck to see what he hit, as well as to see the damage, but sees there's not really an issue, except for maybe some lung butter or like a piece of skin on the headlights. As he pokes it, he immediately gets got and dragged off into the darkness. You see, he could have just walked away. Always get back in your car and leave. Advice from Papa Roanoke. Unless it's a scene of a literal crime, then I'm legally and morally obligated to tell you to stay. The next morning in the great state of Maine, because I really do love that state, a guy named Max wakes up later than usual because he forgot to pay his power bill. I guess you could say his credit cards to pay the bills were already maxed out. <laughs> yes, I accept all forms of hate mail in my P.O. box. He drinks cold coffee and then heads over to his desk. Much like me, he's supposed to be writing, but sometimes your brain just draws a blank. Abandoning that idea, also like me, he drives down the road where he runs into the sheriff, like me. But unlike me, he's got a Tacoma, whereas a forerunner would have worked just as well. The sheriff questions how he heard about this, and Max says, well, I just saw the lights. Being an investigative journalist, which doesn't exist anymore, like, could you imagine all the insane nonsense that would be coming out today if it actually did? He then questions what is happening because he needs that sweet TMZ drama in his life. The sheriff won't speculate, but gives Max something since his power's been turned off. He says it was an animal attack of sorts, but they don't know exactly what it was. The sheriff, however, seems distant and preoccupied, but suggests it was probably a bear or something. Yes, or something. Heading back into town, he calls a forensic pathologist that he's been hooking up with, what a chad, as she informs him there's not really much left of the guy who got attacked, so getting any info from his meat suit is going to be difficult. How do you end up with a forensic pathologist? It's a very interesting question. Calling up another journalist, they squad up, except Max is late, which is rather annoying to her. Max starts telling Harriet, that's her real name, about the traffic stop. Everything about it just seems weird. Max proceeds to say his spider sense is tingling. You might want to get that checked if you start feeling a tingling sensation all the time. Guaranteed to probably be something else. She agrees to help him investigate the woods for this thing, which they now suspect is a man-eating bear. It's a pretty good idea. Why don't you guys just head out there uh, with absolutely no way to counter this thing? Stay strapped or get clapped. It's like, 
they don't they say it's a man-eating bear and they don't even believe it's like you should do anything that there's a man-eating bear in the woods like good luck guys i'm sure you won't make a horrific decision later right so after several hours of searching they have found nothing as they are about to give up, Harriet then spots something. Approaching, they find footprints in the mud, but these footprints seem to be a little small for a bear, and they don't match at all because the toes are different, as there's actually three toes, and bears typically have five being a mammal and all. The toes of this creature, in the way that they are splayed out, would be interesting because it doesn't immediately make you think, oh, this is a bear. I mean, I get that these guys are journalists and are already not playing with a full deck of cards as a result, and I'm required by law to say that's a joke to all the journalists watching. There are some good reporters and journalists out there, just not a lot. But you don't need to be a ornithologist to know that this foot pattern would suggest a two-legged bird, such as an emu or an ostrich. And the way I just said that makes it sound like there are birds with way more legs. There's only, you know, two legs. But the larger of the flightless birds. In what way would you find footprints in the woods and immediately think, oh, it's a bear track, of course. I mean, again, I don't interact with bears really at all. And even I would know this is clearly not a bear track. You are literally wandering around the forest. What? It doesn't matter. So as you're beginning to gather, this may be one of those episodes. Put a helmet on, it's going to be rough. Uh, before we really set in on this, though, I did like the movie. You should check it out. But, bro. So, calling the side piece forensic pathologist again, Harriet looks through pictures. Three toes, see? How do you even remotely confuse this with a bear? Also, the pathologist is married. Woo. That makes Max the side piece. The pathologist had to call in an animal expert from Boston because she had no idea what would have attacked a man like this. Timu version of Sam Winchester offers Harriet a beer and gets turned down, and that's why he's off-brand. While Max is taking fat L's on this side of town, across from town, a woman lets her dog out. Heading outside away from him, she hears Dutch barking, but then immediately stops. And again, just like the last movie we covered, I think it was the last movie, well, yes, the last movie, anytime you hear your dog yelp like that, you need to go back inside, grab the force multiplier, and then you can go back outside to search for him. As she shouts into the darkened woods, eventually she spots a pair of eyes watching her, and then she gets jumped and immediately torn apart by the creature that was like, oh, hey, look, more food. So as we look at its face, we can see black eyes are beset in a scaly face. There's no hair to speak of on its head, which means based on the footprints we have seen, it's definitely still a bear with a deformity concerning its paws with mange and also a completely different set of genetic coding. You see, to understand the thinking, you have to adopt the thinking. Sort of like how the price of groceries currently aren't showing inflation is totally out of control and everything's fine and there's no issues, you're just being crazy about it. Probably a little too close to reality on that one. Moving on. The next day, they zip up what's left of her. Spoilers, it's not much. And remember, the cops are there to zip up the bag. You are your first line of defense. This is looking more and more like a bear attack at this point. And heading to the neighbor's house, Max then asks him about Mrs. Steguard. Max brings up... Why didn't he just go over there that night and also get attacked by the thing that was clearly painting Mrs. Stegard's house red with Mrs. Stegard? I mean, seeing as he seems like the kind of guy who helps people, you think he would. Why would he stop now? Well, Max, it appears he may not believe it was just a bear with a deformity and mange. He mentions that there was a noise that freaked him out, and then he saw something which basically made him not want to exit his house. He describes it also as making a roar with a hiss. So they decide at this point to wait until things cool down to go check the woods outside of Helen's home, where she just got done being attacked. Very good. They find tracks everywhere back there, and at this point, along with Dutch's collar and a hole. As it rains that night, another hole opens up and the creature emerges. We can begin to establish a pattern with it. First, the creature will wait for the rain to exit its den. It burrows under the ground and then drags its prey sometimes back into the den, as it appears with Dutch's collar placement, but... It's also not above just eating you on the gravel driveway as the cops then wash away all the genetic evidence like DNA, forensic abilities, the next morning with a garden hose. Speaking of the next morning, Harriet then gets a text from Max. She goes to pick up some facts at the corner store as she heads over to the house of Max. Their plan with the story is to make fat stacks. Of course, their journalistic ability is pretty lax. And that's the end of that. Thanks for sticking with it. The footprints suggest the creature is actually reptilian and not mammalian. Who would have guessed? Or it's an ostrich with weird man legs. It could definitely be either. Max has identified a pattern of attacks, however. Every 7 to 10 years, the creature comes back up to the area it originally was and starts attacking. It moves through that area in almost a migration type of pattern based on attacks, year after year going further north. Each fall, it moves to a new location where it will circle back around 10 years later to the original spot after the prey in that area has been resupplied or everybody has pretty much forgot about it. Heading into town, Max is looking for a man named Dobson to get some more information about this. 
As they get to the address that he was supposed to be at, they run into his daughter. She tells him that he already passed away and that she hated him. And as they go to leave, Marie mentions how her dad kept saying that a hiss got their dog Blackie. Nobody thought to investigate that any further past that point, as it seems Mr. Dobson was a douche canoe, allegedly. So at this point, they try to figure out why October and November clearly bring out this creature. So they agree to bring in their boss on it, and they decide to take a break, however, and head over to the bar to get a drink. Meanwhile, over at Shady Horse Acres, a man leaves his barn and then hears something in there. Along with a horse shrieking, which according to the subtitles is a thing, I had no idea horses could shriek which in and of itself is horrifying. And as he approaches Locked and Loaded Brides of Christ, there was a hissing and then horse flesh rending. He checks the barn and finds his horse has undergone unscheduled rapid disassembly. Like in just a few seconds, the claws of this creature would have to be sharper than anything any species currently living has. While yes, bear claws can tear you apart or like a lion swiping your head can rend you horrifically uh, decapitated, the horse from what we can see is mostly just a pile of bone and meat. The ability of it to do this would make these claws almost like razor thin, if not thinner than that. Over at the bar, they discuss theories about what they are actually dealing with. The area they live in is being rapidly deforested, which is interesting because a lot of Maine is becoming less and less populated over time. Time to scoop up some land. That way, I could be the next person to be taken out by a cryptid. The American Dream realized. So Max complains about how his dad- Get this! Complains about how his dad worked hard so he could go to college. You heard it right. I mean, what a bold statement, brother. So he's like, oh, but then my, my dad met his end. What a waste of life. It's like, dude, he was sacrificing for you. So Max then left for five years after his old man passed. And then his fiance had ovarian cancer and wanted to come home so that she could be with her family. And then he came with her. And that's how he ended up back home. Max has got some like weird super hangups about how his life is so hard. And all of those that sacrifice for him are somehow at fault and how nobody just randomly gave him a million dollars for existing. Honestly, so deprived. Dude is a mega whiner for this. And at this point, Harriet tells him that she's leaving because she got a job in Boston, and also told him that his uh, perception of the reality is completely skewed and he's an idiot for it. You see, but because she's leaving to go to Boston, Max is the primary victim of someone moving on with their life, giving him another reason to wail and gnash his teeth about it. Max then tells her that she has to stay so they can finish the story. And she says, well, I'll stay as long as I can, but when I gotta go, I gotta go. So after that riveting conversation, Max seems pretty conflicted. And also, I'm pretty sure Harriet took off with the car, giving him a deserved walk in the rain. Of course, Uber does exist, so maybe not. The next day, as Nerd here goes through books to find anything on the creature, he cannot put anything together. He knows it hides, it shows up in October and November, and then moves through, but that's about it. Harriet suggests bringing in the game warden, and Max agrees to at least tell someone as he heads to the corner store to get some coffee. Walking up to pay, Mrs. Alter asks if Max has seen Pippet, and I assume it's her dog or her cat. Also, this is future Roanoke, it's a dog. Which, now that the animals are going missing near his house, as uh, this is his neighbor, it should be a little concerning. As he spots a paper talking about and it's like raining a lot, he gets a Jimmy Neutron brain blast. The rain appears to be connected with these cryptid attacks. As he goes to leave, he then runs into his boss. His boss says, we need to talk, which is always just a good thing, right? Heading outside, Bill basically fires him. He says, I will buy your next story, but after that, our professional relationship is over, indicating that their personal relationship is still fine. But it's kind of hilarious how, like, he says, uh, you'll need somewhere else to get your money. Yeah, man, just say he's fired. Look, this whole channel exists dancing a line between demonetization and remaining monetized through things like wordplay. And even I think this sort of language was just a stupid way to fire somebody. So Max then calls Harriet and tells her to meet at his house the next morning. As Max heads into his house, he hears something in the woods as Twig snaps. Looking in the woods, he hears a creature hiss. Harriet arrives the next morning and heads inside, finding the window open as she looks around before finding Max drinking a beer. Somehow... Max was able to survive because of his plot armor, and even opened a window because of plot armor for reasons unknown. They then head back out to find the hole in the ground near his house. Harriet at this point says, we need to call Charlie, which is the sheriff. So here we are. This thing is right next to your house. You know it is very likely that that's, it's like in the hole, and you've connected at this point that when it rains, it comes out. Why are you not creating Molotov cocktails as we speak and dropping those things down in there with like, people surrounding the hole to take it out as soon as it comes out and like just standing there like what's worse you know this thing hunts humans why are you just so casual about it 
This is like standing next to a lion's den and being like, oh, well, you know, they're nocturnal predators usually, so it's okay if we stand here and not even worry in the slightest. You see, people are getting got in this movie because nobody has any survival instincts and can't think three decisions down the road. This is probably why this creature is able to stay hidden for so long, because humanity collectively downstream results from a progenitor that I guess was dropped on their head as a pre-adult or something, because what in the world is happening here? So heading inside, they talk about the creatures. There's like a lot of talking in this movie if you didn't notice. And Harriet found the creatures attack during the rainiest of seasons. Always a rainstorm before the attacks and they would begin at night. Now Max has a theory when he talked to the animal expert and he asked if any animals hunt in the rain exclusively and the expert stated not presently. In the Holocene Epoch era, which I think we're still in the Holocene era, it was suspected that larger animals, at least during the earlier portions of it, use rain to hunt other animals. So you may wonder why specifically this area, well, it was around this time, it was the last glacial periods existed for a while, which resulted in monsoonal rains to expand even further than where they are now, as there was more energetic moisture in the environment. This tremendously increased rainfall during this period, which the beginning of this period, which led to a shift in the type of rains and how long it would come down for in the temperate and tropical latitudes. In fact, around this time, there was so much moisture everywhere that even the Sahara Desert was transformed into the savanna grassland, and not just like a dry savanna, but a very moist one. Have I said moist and moisture enough to cringe out several of my viewers? It's very likely. The animal expert said that Max and Harriet were idiots for looking at a three-toed footprint that they could have easily just googled and seen it wasn't a bear print. Okay, so he didn't say that, but he may as well have. He goes on to say that they would be reptilian for sure, but much smaller, but would have honed their skills as Harriet says, life, uh, finds a way. Is pretty meta. The animal expert says that the animal has been avoiding detection by society, but this is a very small chance this could have actually happened. Except it happens all the time. Also, Max mentions how it's a cryptid and somehow Harriet doesn't know what a cryptid is. How is that possible? Everyone knows what a cryptid is. So as mentioned, it's not completely odd for a species to evade detection by man for quite some time. While we like to think we completely dominate this planet and for the most part we do, that doesn't mean in the depths of like a forest that man only really flies over It doesn't take the time to thoroughly explore and there couldn't be some sort of species never before seen. But I would have to agree to a certain extent with the animal expert this time. After all, he's the expert. But what are the odds that you would say an animal like this could remain undetected? The deforestation theory does hold some weight, but the reality of it evading detection after operating this area for such an extended period of time with the attacks lining up, that doesn't make much sense. People in medium-sized towns are going missing for quite some time from what we can tell. As soon as the first dropped, People would, as always, suspect maybe an animal is in the area, like a cougar or a bear, and not the fun cougars that you meet at the bar. However, much like how this attack went, the creature isn't more desperate due to land. Its territory just has always appeared to be close to human civilization in this instance. There is no way this creature would have gone undetected for this long, given how close it was conducting hunts near human settlements. So as they call up Charlie, he comes to talk to them, and he doesn't believe them at all, because of course he doesn't. Charlie, however... May not believe them, though, because he just doesn't like Max. They talk about it as Charlie says the victim was partially eaten. His arms and legs were mostly gone and his intestines were completely absent. Charlie says that there is now a third victim, which was a horse a few days ago. Charlie says, it's just a bear, it's not a cryptid. Quit trying to believe things that don't exist. Yes, the famous three-toed bears out in these parts of Maine are acting up again. So they are sitting at a hunting party the next day and then they will know for sure. They end up in a fight as Max brings up Nancy, which was his fiance, which was also Charlie's sister, who he helped raise. This causes Charlie to just straight vibe check Max, which uh, Max always does not pass the vibe check, like ever. He brings up loving Nancy and giving her something that Charlie couldn't. Okay, I don't think it's a mind gutter issue, obviously. It's just a weird thing to bring up. Is Maine the new Alabama? I don't know. What's going on in Maine? Horrific revelations of subtext aside, which most definitely is not the subtext the movie is implying, but it just comes off a little sus. After being punched in the face, how does that not activate Max's almonds is beyond me. He sits there and talks to Harriet about all everything and then starts having a bit of a moment with her. And they're just about to go for it as he's reading all the signals. But instead, Harriet gets up, likely thinking Max is a little too whiny for her taste anyhow. Later that night, Harriet returns back to the house with another guy for some reason. I don't know if I missed some dialogue or what, but... I went back and I'm still not sure why this was the case. It must have been something when they were talking. I don't know. Getting out of the car, she goes to Max's door. Again, it's raining. And the hole, as you know, is just outside his house. 
Nobody would be worried about that, I suppose. Like, seriously, you know the creature is there. You know it's outside. Why are you putting yourself in harm's way on purpose? But because of this stupidity, as Max goes to answer the door, he spots Harriet has been slashed by something as she gets dragged off by the creature. It rises up and is bipedal as it tries to enter the house, but then realizes Max is the main character, so it just sort of stops. With a face like a crocodile and arms like a human, it walks past the window and has taken out Harriet and is snacking on its woman witch. Or would be woman witch. Doesn't matter. Rather than grabbing like a force multiplier, an axe, a kitchen knife, a bat, literally anything to defend your friend and showing this thing it's man's time, not reptile, he has a nice cry and is given a blanket and some hot cocoa to feel better when the cops arrive. Okay, maybe not that last part, but they may as well have done it. Again, Max is the primary victim of this attack. <laughs> like one sharpened stick is all I'm saying. Max stays taking fat L's due to his own self-absorption. Go caveman on it. It's the size of man. You can take that thing. Tear it apart. I hate you, Max. The next morning, the mayor reams the sheriff, I think. Maybe the sheriff's like, oh, by the way, we know somebody just got taken out last night, but the situation's been handled. It, it has not been handled. And Max is also angry about the passing of Harriet, which he could have done something. So Max calls Charlie and says there's not much time to take this thing out. Max is asking for help, but either way, he's going to go hunt it down and gut it like a fish himself. Also, he uses Harriet's phone to call the sheriff because I guess his is turned off. Broke. Like, that's bizarre. <laughs> Finding a force multiplier, which he could have totally brought out earlier. You, you idiot. You're honestly an idiot. I don't, know what's, I don't know what's wrong with you. He literally had it the whole time. Charlie shows up with a posse. Charlie hands Max his pellet dispenser back. Well, it might be a rifle. I'm not really sure. I should probably find that out. So the squad is there because they've all been personally affected by the creature or because it's their job. Charlie apologizes to Max and considers Max's family for some reason. He says, I was just upset when I sucker punched you. So as they set out into the woods for super happy cryptid hunting fun time, which uh, in 2027, I'm actually supposed to be doing that if Roanoke Tales reaches 1 million subscribers by then, they turn off their flashlights so that they can see with their eyes instead of with the beam of light. They pull the map and start hunting where the creature is supposed to be popping up next. They head towards Jackson's farm, you know the one, as it's open land with no rocks or trees. Of course, the thing just dug a hole near rocks and in the tree line at Max's, so I wonder really how reliable that idea is. They then find tracks on the ground as they can finally start tracking it. As they move through, the tracks abruptly stop. John immediately gets grabbed as blood starts spurting in random directions like anime attack style and he's pulled underground by the creature Trimmer style, which uh, is not an ideal situation for him. Max also jumps down the hole due to his plot armor, survives his encounter for the moment, but is knocked out by a three foot fall. Awakening in the cave system, I still don't understand how he lost consciousness. Perhaps we should get him a blanket and some hot cocoa. He calls out for Charlie and tries to escape, but his new alarms can't pull him up, gets swole. At this point, you know this thing is the size of you and you have a force multiplier. Even if you have to like beat it to death, let the adrenaline flow. Up on the surface, Charlie takes a shot at it, but they don't know if it hit or where it even went at this point. So now Daniel Boonhat, also known as Sonny, cuts his hand to attract the creature away from its den by putting blood on the trees. So Max now starts searching the den as he finds a lot of people have been eaten. Or that person is probably Harriet. <laughs> that's, that's not ideal. He then finds eggs. Smash them immediately. Of course, one starts hashing at this point. Again, smash them immediately. And the creature runs by slashing his legs, injuring him. I think this may have been the offspring as it attacks and then runs, but I'm not 100% sure. Because we see eggs, we do have to assume a few things. Now I do have, like I see two questions, maybe even three, but four? You're crazy, it can never be four. Starting with A, is this creature coming from an established population? The answer is maybe. I know, ambiguous, right? It may be possible that this particular animal has found a mate, and it may be the thing that Max got attacked by here uh, in a moment was the male, or it could be the female. It doesn't really know which, but reptiles, at least, some are known to have the ability to reproduce asexually. If a female reptile is alone for long enough, the eggs of certain variants, such as Komodo dragons, pythons, whiptails, and some lizards, to name a few, will start producing young. Now, they are pretty much identical to the mother's genetic coding because it is asexual reproduction, but it's sort of like cheat mode because even if the mother passes from old age, a copy of her genes lives on. Two, if there is an established population here, why haven't they been seen before? I can only assume that since this creature burrows and waits, it would not have been seen on the surface at any point in time that man would take notice. And believe it or not, Using the cover of rain is actually an excellent hunting technique. This may be how both males and females are able to stay hidden if there is more than one. By then linking up in this den, it may be that the parents also bond prior to their eggs hatching, which in turn explains what we'll see later. 
And D, this species, while being a cryptid, clearly plays a very natural role concerning the egg laying. So, would it be stranger than any other animal that we have seen? Not really. So, dinosaurs are known to lay eggs well before the Holocene, obviously, which I'm tipping my hand way too early on this one. But while it is believed all dinosaurs went extinct well before this time frame, the fact is, is that potentially, if a certain reptile were to burrow, it does open up some interesting survival prospects if this was a surviving member of the dinosaur race. Now, obviously, uh, there were dinosaurs that seemed to burrow around this time, but mostly it was a mammalian trait, a small mammal trait specifically. There was a collection of events that happened that spelled the doom of dinosaurs, such as asteroids, or at least one asteroid in particular, causing a nuclear winter, and then volcanic activity, which these hits just kept coming, which completely disassembled the food web, leading to large carnivores to meet their end as a result. If a reptilian species that potentially survived that cataclysm burrowed much like other mammals, it may be like how since those dens protected mammals, the reptilian den did the same thing. Of course, there also seems to be another factor to all this. The species hunts in two months and then disappears afterwards as they are down in their den, and this indicates that after they eat enough, they enter a period of hibernation. Upon awakening, they will then hunt a new area. With the food incredibly scarce during this original extinction event, it may be that the hibernation cycle largely saved them from the brutal winter, and then they were able to just find enough food to get by. As a result, they would hibernate most of the year, wake up, move to a new area where survivors were just getting by as well, and do the same thing. Over time, the skies would clear and the food would become more available. And just like a crocodile not having changed for millions of years, this species would have no reason to change from its original body plan, meaning no feathers or fur would grow in its body as it worked. Because remember, evolutionarily speaking, if it works, while random mutations can happen, typically the body remains the same structuring or remains in the same structuring through subsequent generations. Accompanying this, the hypothesized ability to reproduce asexually means that it was really just an unbroken line. There's no telling how many of these things out there there really are. There could be an unknown established population where genes are exchanged, but it may also be that since nobody has ever seen these things before, that this is the last remaining of its species and just keeps its line going through asexual reproduction. Blooding the trees, they post up, hearing a hissing noise as Charlie goes to investigate. Sonny unfortunately gets got as this thing pushes him down and attacks. Charlie takes a shot at it as Sonny tells him to go finish it off, my wound isn't that bad. But it is in fact that bad. Meanwhile, Max is having a blast as the creature comes back and bites his leg. Again, it is unknown at this time if this is a male or female of the den, because we are not shown anything concerning sexual dimorphism, or who laid these eggs, or if this is just the offspring of the bigger one outside. I mean, this thing looks also like a miniature bipedal crocodile as it starts biting him, which is incredibly creepy. He fires a shot and ends the thing's whole career, and that's literally all it took. He could have saved Harriet with a sharpened stick. Looking at his leg, it's injured pretty badly. He tourniquets it, but his arm is also injured pretty good as well. Bites will do that. I mean, if you hit a brachial artery just right, you got about 30 seconds before you bleed out. Max then hears Sonny on top of the den calling out. As Sonny says, he heard a scream, which means what Max just took out wasn't Big Mama. Max continues searching the den and starts to, I assume, like, was gonna go smash some of the creatures. Instead, he cuts off its arms. I think it, yeah, he must, because it's an incredibly dark movie. And he pulls the arms up and uses them to dig into the sides of the walls so he can literally claw his way out. Max now hears a hiss as Sonny gets got. The real creature has returned and not just some lowly offspring, or smaller sexual dimorphism one. I, I don't know what that one was. But it squares up on Max growling as then it takes several shots to its back and is dragged back out by Charlie. Charlie showed up to clap this thing from behind as Max then awakens in a hospital as he's prone to being knocked out. With his wounds dressed, Charlie tells him he passed out after he took the creature, you know, down, and as Max tells him, oh no, there were eggs in the den, they return back to find that all the eggs have hatched, and Max says he will now stay in town to help hunt these creatures, and just like his father and fiance, he is now bound to the area through a sense of duty, and thus concludes Cryptid. This specific species definitely appears to hail from before the Holocene Epoch. It would still possess many of the hunting tactics that it would have gotten from prior to this era and then developed during this area, which made it smaller. But it still, regardless of where it came from, is reptilian in nature. It appears to have the ability to hibernate for up to a year, which may have secured its future survival as the animals that it may have hunted went extinct, allowing for it to change tactics and hunt other animals on the surface that came out. But the question from here is, where did it come from specifically, and who is its progenitor? It's really hard to say as there's like a multitude of issues here. 
This species, while existing in the Holocene, appears to go, again, further back than that. I would suggest it potentially goes all the way back to the dinosaurs given its overall appearance. It is suggested that since it's a reptile, it would have had to decrease in size over time to accommodate for smaller prey in the area, as well as changing oxygen levels. I would also suggest that because there does not appear to be very many of them, this is why it was able to keep its dinosaur-esque appearance. With no new incoming genetic information because there are no other partners around, it may be that it was able to maintain it because there's no incoming information to alter its physiology in subsequent generations. Now again, that could have been a mate down in the den, but it's never really intrinsically shown that it was. But also, this creature would become smaller, at least in subsequent generations, due to nutritional changes, but largely concerning its physiology, it would have stayed the same. If it does relate back to dinosaurs, then considering it stands on two legs, it may have been a few things, but the face puts it past either like a raptor or a small T-Rex. I would have to say these things are related to the ancient two-legged crocodiles. Now, I know what you're thinking. Those were huge. Yes, some of them were. There are other variants of these horrific creatures that would have actually only gone up to about the height of the average man's waist when they were like literally standing. However, they were as long as like 12 to 15 feet, roughly about four to 4.75 meters. And this species appears to have been left over in an area, but then over time, it would have to alter its behavior to burrow into the ground, which may have been done due to temperature variations over time, because if you're in Maine, it gets cold. But one of the interesting things that you should know about Maine is there's never been any dinosaur fossils actually found there. So this is all speculated because the reality is how this creature presents itself amongst the physical structurings of its face and its behaviors indicates that this species may have been one all on its own and simply lived and expired without humans ever knowing about it, thus making it pretty much a real cryptid. But anyhow, I want to hear what you guys think. What do you think this thing was? Could you have taken it out with a spear? I think if it attacked somebody I cared about, absolutely. Let me know down in the comments. If you enjoyed, then please leave a like as it gets the video out there. And subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on when I post. Hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. And as we move into like the Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, or nothing, did, I, do pagans do anything? I don't know. I hope you guys have a good time celebrating regardless. I'll drop my Twitter, merch, Discord, Patreon, and channel links to Rono Tales, where this week, uh, we talked about the Wolf Siege of Paris. I was supposed to do that last week. Totally got sidetracked. Anyhow, speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astronaut from, like, I totally missed him, but 9 plus 10, 21. Like I said, missed you the other day, but thank you, bro. Also, our astrophysicist, Des Dancer. Thank you as well. And next up, our scientist, Chad, the enjoyer of scientific explanations of B-grade horror movies, Dakota 23, Florian, Lacune, Lucian Dragon, Octavia Serpentia, and the last final girl on the left. Thank you guys as well. And to the rest of my patrons, your support is greatly appreciated and you're absolute ballers. But that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed and I'll see y'all in the next one.